everyone. Thank you for joining us for Cap and Gown Season 4, Episode 14. We are going to talk today to Dr. Nancy Schenkel about transfer student barriers. I'm very excited about this conversation. Yeah. Um, I'm Rachel Phillips Buck, VP for Student Success at Ferris Resources, joined today by uh, Matt Boisbert, our president. Hey, Matt. Hi, Rachel. Yeah, today's going to be great. Yeah. Hey, thanks for joining me for State of the Union. It's always weird when I have to talk to myself, so I really <laughs> <laughs> you putting on a jacket today and agreeing to hang out with me. Yeah. Um, so we have a couple of things that I want to talk about before we dive into State of the Union. You remember that our theme of the year is curiosity. So we are giving you a glimpse inside our brains about what our Google searches have been for the past week. I have my four. Do you have yours ready? I do. Okay. However, uh -oh. I just want to say, you know, I was so excited about our um, Oh Joy Throughout the World or Happiness Found in Translation book. Yeah. I was like, how do you, how do you make that, a, how do you replace that? Yeah. And so I, <laughs> so I bought a book. <laughs> what does it say? Brain Candy? Brain Candy. So this is National Geographic for kids. Okay. But, you know, if you don't know it as an adult, maybe it's time. This is the and, this is like curiosity. Yeah, this is, these are sweet facts to satisfy your curiosity. Oh, okay. okay. Well, All give right. me one. Well, this I did not. I did not know. I, I, I bet Dr. Shankle knew this, but I didn't know. Okay, if you look at and you're trying to decide, is that a sheep or a goat? Like you see something off in the distance, is that a sheep or a goat? Goat tails always point up. And sheep tails always point down. Okay. And there you go. Besides the fact that they look different, I, if all well, you could see is their tail, you for sure would have, <laughs> right? If you're coming up from behind, you ah. There you go. You know, all right. That tail's down. All right. So anyway, I'm, I'm going to dig in. We'll find some right. sweet. In the theme of Google searches. Oh, yeah. I searched for the King's Fish House in San Diego because you, me, and Shauna are going to San Diego for the CCCU conference tomorrow. And we yeah. are going to dinner. So if you're going to be there, come and have dinner with us on Thursday. Big, yep. Big dinner. You're invited. Also, I looked up how long can you leave a package in an Amazon locker? <laughs> the answer is three days. Just so you know. Hey. After three days, they come and take it back. Okay? okay. And then we had lunch and learn with our interns yesterday. And which led to a whole conversation about um, generations. So I looked up why is the alpha generation called that, which is our your youngest daughter, my daughter's generation. It's because yeah. they're the first generation to be born entirely in the 21st century and in the third millennium. And I looked up zennials, which is a sub generation of the... What are you? X. Gen X. Yeah. yeah. So it's 1977 to 1983 is this like very small population of people who had analog childhoods. So we didn't have any technology. And then in our very early or I guess late adolescence started getting email and that sort of thing. So this is a very sub small subpopulation Xennials. There you go. And you want to go by, you would rather be a Xennial than Gen X. I mean, it's, you know, it's fancy. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Awesome. Okay. Yeah. Okay. What are your you, four? You want to hear my, okay. Well, <clears throat> um, <laughs> I'm going to go in, in reverse order here. So Mr. Gorgos, I, I had to look this guy up who disappeared, said he was going out like on Thanksgiving or right. Christmas Eve, said he's going to go get something left disappeared for 30 years 30 years later shows up back at home in the same clothes that he left in and doesn't know what happened he says he doesn't know what i don't happened. know gorgos mr gorgos it's a big mystery. Oh, mystery um i i wanted i looked up a quote that i i was telling you that i grew up with that was in my house um a little plaque that I had growing up that is excellence can be attained if, and it, so this is like what made me, me, I think, you know, 
<clears throat> the saying. So I had to look that up. I looked up Happy Days Owl, you know, like Owl's Diner. Happy oh, Days yeah. Owl. Yep, yep, yep. Because that came to mind. I wanted to watch a video of them. And then Multnomah Village, uh, Oregon, in in uh, Portland. So they, I, I found an article about them buying these tiny homes to address the homeless problem. Yeah. And so I wanted to refresh my memory on Portland Multnomah Village. Of course, I did a whole lot of searching about uh, Relis and in our conversation today with Dr. Nancy Shankle. And I mean, that was, that was like that was your deep dive, huh? my big deep dive. So anyway, right, there, you go. Well, there you go. Sorry, guys, that is a look into our brains and what <laughs> happens on a weekly basis. So let's move on to the State of the Union, shall we? All right, Matt, you are right. FAFSA is not in our State of the Union today because there is no change. It's still bad. People are still struggling with it. So yeah. no news on that. However, you remember that attorneys general in two states, Tennessee and Virginia, sued the NCAA after the association threatened to penalize uh, the University of Tennessee at Knoxville for rules violations. Um, while the NCAA was forced to loosen its rules to allow the athletes at its member colleges to receive compensation for likeness, it continues to be against NCAA rules for colleges themselves, including booster groups, to use NIL incentives to recruit athletes. Well, Judge Clifton Corker of the U.S. District Court for the Eastern District of Tennessee issued an injunction barring the NCAA from enforcing its name, image, and likeness policy citing not the impact on the University of Tennessee, but instead on the athletes. So he yeah. was like, hey, guys, we don't know what the fair market value for these athletes is. And when you start making rules about it, when we don't actually know what's going on, it is not fair for athletes. You're taking out their negotiation leverage. And so that's who it's harming. So NCAA, you are not allowed to enforce whatever rules you may have about it for your athletes right now. So it's a temporary injunction. We don't actually know what the outcome of that is going to be, but I think it's really interesting for the NCAA to kind of be handcuffed in that case. Yeah. That, like, don't make this. Stuff, right? This this is like if FAFSA was not in the news. That this really is as as uh, NIL is just we're just starting to learn and yeah. um, uncover, and then you've got this this NCAA challenge. So Pretty it's interesting. It's I like it. Okay, I mean I like the topic. Okay, some other good news is that U.S. colleges received $58 billion in philanthropic uh, support in fiscal year 23. So it is a 2.5% decline from the year before, but that was like a banner year. So this $58 billion is the second highest on record. Um, really interesting foundations, donor advised funds and corporations, the uh, donations from them rose 2.7%. There was a drop in alumni giving and non-alumni giving about 10% in both groups. They think it's just because of the stock market, but this is a survey coming out of uh, 757 institutions that are wow. still pretty strong. If you think about the um, commitment to higher education and people's support of it, still pretty strong uh, compared to what we've seen in some previous years. So it's just a great, I mean, great climate for some of the innovative things that are happening, like at Hope College that we've talked yeah, about, right? So, for sure. Yeah. Um, hopefully, <clears throat> the the distribution of that fifty-eight billion is is going to great um, ideas, right? Not just your okay. Family. Another thing that has been in the news quite a bit, which we're not landing on very clearly, is the consensus or non-consensus, I guess, about standardized testing policies. So first, before we dive into this article, which I would recommend you read because it's a very long article and it has a lot of really good information about all of the different ways that you can sort of interpret the data about who's testing, what, what groups testing is helping and hurting. But first of all, let me tell you this, because this is something else I had to Google. There are four choices when it comes to tests, okay? You have schools that are test required, 
That one's pretty straightforward. You got to have a test, right? Then you have test optional, which is where students can decide if they want to send in a test score. And if they do, the school will consider it, but they're not giving it tons of weight because not everybody is sending it in. So it's like, yeah, if, if you think that presents you in a better light, take the test and send it in. Okay. Okay. Then we have test flexible, which is like, what test would you like to send us? So you can send us ACT or you can send us SAT or you can send us AP test or subject test or there's a lot of different tests that schools that are test flexible are accepting. Okay. And then we have test blind, which is you're welcome to send in your test if you want to, but we will not look at it or consider it. We're not paying any attention to your test. So you can make it part of your application, but we're not going to look at it. We're going to put it in the shredder. Okay. So those okay. are the definitions. It's in the news today because two highly selective institutions who looked at the same data made opposite decisions about what they were going to do with their testing. So the University of Michigan formally adopted a test optional policy. Um, they sort of resisted. This was like a new wave in 2020. They were like, we're not doing it. Now they've decided, yes, we're going to go to test optional. And then Yale, who had operated with the temporary test optional policy, decided to do test flexible. So they're accepting a lot of different tests uh, for students. What I think is so interesting about this article, and one of the reasons I think it's worth a read, is just because both schools are looking at the same data and actually giving you the same reason that they made the decisions that they made. So they both are like, we think it increases equity. We think it increases um, the ability for students who maybe wouldn't be able to come to our school to better come to our school, to better demonstrate that they could be successful here, looking at the same data, but very, very different interpretations. Yeah, that's so, fascinating. You know, we don't have time to go into all of that now, but I just think it's it's worth the read because obviously no one's trying to do a bad thing, but there's no consensus. And I don't think there's going to be consensus. And Matt, you and I were talking about one of the things that I think is super hard is that if you're applying to five different schools and you have five different standards of what you should be sending, it can be very confusing for a family to try to navigate what they should be doing, right? So yeah. very interesting. One more, one more thing coming out of COVID, right? So when through right. COVID, test optional, like you said, so Yale's became temporarily test optional. Um, it is just interesting how they can look at the exact same data and come to totally different conclusions. Yeah. Um, all right. And then you and I have been talking quite a bit about this idea of career development across the university. Just we need to be able to articulate. We, I think we do a good job of liberal, liberal arts education articulation. But I think there are a lot of students and a lot of parents these days who are really looking for career outcomes. And I'm seeing that in the news these days. So there's an article out of Inside Higher Ed about um, the Virginia Commonwealth University who has created a career champion training program. Their career center was like, listen, we know that students are talking to faculty about career concerns and we're not positive that our faculty are well-trained on how to tell students what to do around those areas, right? So they've created a training um, process. It takes about half a day. They go through career decision-making, experiential learning and workforce preparation. They learn about all of the services that the Career Center offers to students. And then also they talk about career, uh, sorry, key career development theories, career readiness competencies. Matt, you know from when you and Braden were in the Career Center, this idea of how to ethically and equitably engage with employers and outside organizations. This is like a whole thing that people have no idea that there right. are rules around it, right? right? So after faculty go through this, they get a sticker that they can put on their door that says they have completed the, they are now a career champion. Okay. Um, and 100% of the, let's see, 50 or so people on their campus who took it would recommend it or strongly recommend it to their colleagues. So I love that idea of if, if that's where our students are going to be looking for advice, let's make sure that we're equipping our faculty to be able to do that. I will say. Well, I was gonna, I was going to say right then, like your model was, hey, rather than you talk about it, let me come and 
talk to your class. So yeah, so at our university, we would have our U100 instructors talking about career stuff. And I sat in in a couple of those and I was like, this is terrible. Not all of them, you know, some of them did a good job, but some of them were pretty terrible. And I was like, I will come to all 50 of our first year experience classes and give the same spiel because it's really important to be able to control that. So I think I think there's a happy medium in there, right? I think it's really helpful for faculty to understand some of the intricacies and if students are going to be talking to them. But also, I think there's a place where you're like, hey, let's go see Matt. He has some expertise on this, right? Yeah, I always like to think that when you would come into a class and, and talk to the class, that you're actually helping the, the professor learn also, right? Yeah. So so I think it's you're delivering both. I love this idea of, of teaching faculty, like, hey, here, putting them through that, because for a lot of them, they haven't thought about career career decision-making in a long time. Sure. So, But also, don't you think, I feel like every week now, I've had a different story about another thing faculty should be doing. Yeah. They've got to be trained to manage mental health problems. They've got to be trained in career. They've got to be trained. And at some point, I just think, you know, what we always say to our schools is, we recognize those faculty relationships are so important. Leverage those to get the student to the resource that the faculty or that the yeah, university yeah. is investing in to be able to help those students. So I think it's I think it's a fine line. I think you have to be really careful about just continuing to add new things to faculty members' plate. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Also related to career, um, more than half of recent four year four year college graduates are underemployed. So this is a survey that came out of um, a lot of like federal data sources, job ads, online resumes, career profiles for more than 60 million workers. They're looking at uh, college graduates who are underemployed, which they're defining as a college graduate holding a job that doesn't require a bachelor's degree signified by at least half of the employees in that role not having one. OK, so okay. At least half of the people don't have a college degree, probably don't need one for this role. 52% um, of recent four-year college graduates are underemployed a year after they graduate. And after a decade of uh, a decade after graduation, 45% of them still don't hold a job that requires a four-year degree. Wow. Um, report found that graduates who started their career at below college level jobs typically stayed underemployed for years afterwards. The majority of graduates, 73% who were underemployed in their first job, remained so a decade after they graduated. That's pretty amazing, right? So it means that that very first job is a pivotal role in the trajectory of what's going to happen for your career. Um, this affects black graduates more. 60% of black graduates were underemployed compared to 53% of white graduates. Um, and then things like the kind of institution, the majors that they had, all of those, this article kind of pulls out all of those different elements. Um, but what I'm thinking is just in terms of our institutions, if you know that that first job is so pivotal, and this article talks about how internships have a huge impact on making sure that you're not under, uh, un, what, do, what do they call it? Employed. Under. So if you think about your institution, making sure that we have internship opportunities for our students and really working hard on that very first job for them and saying, we wanna make sure that you're in the right field and, and you're doing what you need to be doing to, to have a good trajectory, right? There's just a whole lot that I, you know, we don't have time to unpack, but, but really I think that that connection of career readiness and internship, just focusing on those two things makes a huge impact on this idea of, of being right side employed, right? For sure. Okay, I have two more for you. The first one is University of Minnesota Morris has created three-year degree plan uh, degree plans, which I really love. They stuck with their 120 credit requirements, but they're like, hey, we've worked on this. It's going to save you save you about twenty thousand um, dollars in your tuition costs. They have thirty four of their Bachelor of Arts degrees that now you can do in three years. And they're solving this problem by leaning really, really heavily on high school experiences. So whether that's AP or you're taking dual credits or you're taking college classes in high school, 
they're capturing that as your kind of your first year, your high school experience, and then they're giving you your three years uh, to continue. Um, and they're depending on students to take 17 credit hours per semester, which is a little bit high, but they're like most of the time when students are wanting to do this, they're kind of overachievers anyway, so we think it's gonna be manageable for them. The thing that I think is funny about this article is that the chancellor of University of uh, Minnesota Morris said, it's pretty random that 120 credit hours were selected. It isn't really for a strong reason, but it's so embedded in higher education that a change would be terrifying. <laughs> so just the idea that it's like, but it's always been that and kind of that's right. the way and where we would, why would we change it? I think is really indicative of how hard it is to change in higher education. Even right. Great reason. Well, if you have time, this is, this is a, this would be a great topic for Dr. Shankle also. Yeah. <laughs> for sure. I mean, yeah. Okay. But that's, so 17 hours, six semesters, they're going to have to do some some more work over the summer as well. I, I would imagine you're going to have to take some classes in the mm. summer. All right. The last one I want to tell you, which I, the, the, wet, the, the trip I went on with this article, so let me just take you with me. How about that? All right. Okay. Um, some employers are wary of Gen Z workers, okay? So they're saying it's kind of a perfect storm of like social media uprising and COVID has made some managers, directors and executives about 38% said they would avoid hiring a recent graduate, that they prefer older workers and 58% say recent graduates are underprepared for the workforce, which we just read a study that students were like, I feel like I'm underprepared for the workforce, yeah. right? So I, I don't think it's, this article is very good to say like, hey, older generations are always poo-pooing the younger generations. Like they always have something oh, to say about Oh, for sure. It goes, goes back to Aristotle. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, but there are some soft skills that they're saying these students are really missing out. It's like they're not kind of queuing into work culture. They're not picking up, like gathering information and drawing conclusions. So there's a company called the Education Design Lab, which works directly with employers to say, for this job, what are some of the soft skills that students need, uh, particularly in this job? They yeah. created micro-credentialing for nine core competencies for students, self-directed learning, empathy, oral communication, critical thinking, resilience, intercultural fluency, collaboration, creative problem solving, and initiative. So it takes 12 hours to complete these micro credentials. Over 800 higher education institutions offer them for free. And students are just going through and then they're able to put on their resume like, hey, I've been credentialed in empathy, for example, or I've been credentialed in creative thinking. So for example, there's a school that does this for their EMTs. They pay for all of their EMT technicians to get micro credentialed on critical thinking, problem solving, and empathy. They're like, those are the most important things for those jobs. We want to make sure you're you're really well trained on that. So I love that. I'm fascinated. I need to do more research. The trip I went is I went to their website and I can't understand anything on it. You went too. <laughs> I'm not it up. It's like so complicated and it's like so many links. So I'm going to have to talk to somebody there because I'd love to understand better what they're doing. Yeah. Their email. Well, address. we do need we do need to talk to them because what they what they're talking about ties into a lot of the things that we've I been love it. About. I know. Yeah. I love it. I wish they had a better website. So I will I, I just want to know I, I want to know who their schools are. Like who who are they partnered with? So yeah, that's great. Sure. Education de design labs, if you're listening, yeah. we we, we want to know more better. about what you do. I love it. All right. Well, that is the State of the Union, which means that I am going to say goodbye to Matt. Thanks for joining me so I didn't talk to myself. <laughs> sure. And I'm going to welcome Dr. Schenkel. Um, hi. Thank you so much for joining us today. Hello. I'm very Thank excited you. for this conversation because I think you all are doing something so remarkable um, and so interesting. And as we've just talked about, the pivot in higher education to innovative programs is incredibly difficult. <laughs> so um, let me formally introduce you, Dr. Schenkel, who's the Associate Vice Chancellor and Provost at Relis Academic Alliance, starting just in August of 2019. 
I want to talk all about that program um, and really unpack it. But I have a couple of questions for you before we start down that path. So my first question is, I think I found your dissertation. Did you write your dissertation on <laughs> George Whitefield? Yes, and it's pronounced Whitfield, but spelled oh, Whitefield. Whitefield. Yes, many okay, years George ago. <laughs> yes. So he was a preacher, is that right? Mm -hmm. And yes. you, your dissertation is kind of like, hey, we need to go back and examine his sermons with a critical eye. Is that fair to say? Yes. <laughs> okay. Yes, yes. It's hard to find somebody's <laughs> dissertation. You know, you got to do a lot of digging. So I'm glad that I could find that. Um, so let's talk for just a second about why did you decide to get involved in higher education? Uh, my experience as a first generation student, I was uh, really uh, one of those kids that loved school. Uh, I I, I definitely belonged in school. It, it was fun to me. Uh, I, I was just one of those bright, kind of nerdy kids, loved <laughs> studying, loved learning, just really loved learning. Uh, but I was first generation and didn't know, you know how to get started. Once I got started, found my home in college, I just never wanted to leave. So that pushed me into a career in higher ed, primarily uh, the, the first two thirds of my career was uh, academics, solid academics. But I really wanted to reach out to those kids that I identified with those first time in college kinds of kids. So I'm curious about sort of the leap from, I've never gone to college before to then saying like, hey, maybe that's a thing that I would consider is that did teachers say to you we think your college material or mm -hmm. how did you make that leap into yes this okay. is the thing i'm gonna do so two things i was in high school and i was at a school in louisiana in bossier city and the campus was a high school but it also had two years of a junior college and my professor of, of world history also taught uh, in the other building in the to the, the college kids. And he would tell us about what he was teaching them. And that sort of opened my eyes. Oh, there's another building. I can go on and do uh, a, a college degree. And then another connection, when I was a senior in high school, my aunt, my, my mother's older sister, had, and she's a fascinating story in herself, she married at 15, had two children by the time she was 19, and then divorced at 20 from an abusive husband, married again, moved to Arkansas, and uh, raised her children. So she was in her mid-30s when she was an empty nester. She went to business college, learned to type, got a job at the local community college, earned her uh, and then eventually earned her degree, went on to earn a bachelor's degree, then went to a and Commerce and earned her master's degree and her doctorate. Wow. And finished her, and she was uh, in grad school when I was in high school. And uh, she went on to be a teacher at Eastfield Community College before she retired. And so that was like, oh my goodness, who is this person doing this? And it was something nobody in our family had done. But uh, since then, uh, uh, you know, there, there have been many, many others in our family. I also have an uncle who went back to school on the GI Bill. So I, I have some role models like that. But in terms of my immediate family, uh, no, we... Yeah. We didn't have that tradition of following in our parents. And I'm firstborn, so I didn't have the experience of following my older brother or sister, which is another thing that happens very often. I love that mental curiosity, right? Like you in high school, yeah. like what is happening over there? And that seems like maybe a place I want to be. I love yes. that. 
And we always talk about the changing of the trajectory of a family tree, right? That, that you do have trailblazers yes. that in the family, once you do that thing, everybody around you is like, oh, that's a thing then that I could accomplish as well. So I love that so much. So you, you, yes, started I've seen that in my own family too. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead. So you started with English, right? That was your, your mm -hmm. primary education was English. Why did you pick English? I love to read. Uh, I, I love to read and it, you know, it just, uh, most days homework didn't feel like homework. It was something that was just, uh, came very natural to me. It, it actually wasn't my first major. My first major was accounting. I spent a semester as an accounting major and then I know and uh, <laughs> did well in my classes, but I also took an English class and then decided uh, English classes were just a lot more fun than accounting. Yeah. My accounting <laughs> professor was kind of sad to hear me changing my major uh, but that's not uncommon with English majors. When I was on faculty at uh, at Abilene Christian University, among our professors, I think uh, out of the 30 professors, I think only one started as an English major in college. All of the rest of us started as something else than either change majors. And several of us even, uh, not me, but some of the other faculty, even had undergraduate degrees in a di different field, marketing, or we even had an engineering professor really? that switched over. We Yes, so uh, English, it, it tends to be when people um, find where their passion is versus uh, sort of the expectation of, I'll go on this career path to, you know, to get a job or something like that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, I read that you wrote about something that's called grammar anxiety. Can you tell mm -hmm. me what grammar yes. anxiety is? <laughs> okay, so that uh, article started with a conversation at, at a kid's basketball game when my son was uh, playing basketball and we were there on a Saturday and I was uh, sitting there and one of the other moms came up and said, hi, I'm so-and-so, and I introduced myself. And she said, where do you work? And I said, well, I, I work at the university and I'm a professor there. And, and you know, just, she was asking questions. We were just having a conversation. And she said, well, what do you teach? And I said, English. And she froze and she started backing up. And she said, it's my worst subject. I'm terrified of it. She got up and moved and oh, no. wouldn't have it. I was like, please, I'm I'm in my jeans and t-shirt and I'm a mom. I, I'm not a professor. The, a monster. I'm, not, yeah. I'm not judging you, but uh, I've seen that reaction. People just freeze when they think oh, it's an English professor. I have to watch what I say. I might say the wrong thing, all, all of that. Well, from that, I began looking at some of the students in my classes and they were also struggling with some of that fear of English. And so I began doing some research through a, a kind of a scholarship of teaching research approach and discovered there was nothing uh, out there on, on anxiety, that, those kinds of anxieties in grammar, in English. But it was, of course, you, you've heard of math anxiety. You're right. Uh, and then uh, there's also test anxiety. And so uh, I use some of the methodology that researchers have used with math anxiety and adapted it to my classroom and then, you know, did the surveys with my students and came up with some interventions and things to help those that had that kind of anxiety really respond a little bit better in the class. It's so interesting that 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 test anxiety and math anxiety come so easily. I mean, right. Everybody understands what that is. And and I think when you say grammar anxiety, it does resonate with people. It's just maybe not something that they've been introduced to before. Right. So right. I really appreciate that. And I am such a big proponent of naming things. If you say to students, grammar anxiety exists and this is how you experience it. And here are things we can do. 
it just alleviates all of that concern. What's wrong with me? And it moves it into this is a thing that we know about and we can talk about. And there's there's strategies for that. So I really love love that idea of grammar strategy, uh, grammar anxiety. All right. So let's move on to our big topic, which is about Relis Academic Alliance. Can you frame for us first the transfer problem? So there's just a lot of barriers and there's a lot of data about how transfer students experience their journey. Can you frame the problem for us to start? Yes. Transfer students, uh, we have many, many transfer students around the nation. They often start at community colleges. Some of them start at four-year institutions and for whatever reason decide it's not a fit or maybe there's a boyfriend or girlfriend across the state, another institution. There, It happens for four-year institutions too, but especially those community colleges. Students start at community colleges. That's such a powerful uh, purpose for those, uh, those community colleges because they are usually much lower cost. They're very accessible. They're local, all of those kinds of things. So we have many transfer students nationwide. Uh, of the transfer students, uh, recent research, uh, I mean, this has been going on for a while, but even as recent as uh, 2023 surveys release, 80% of the community college students say they want to transfer and earn a bachelor's degree. 30% actually transfer. And of that 30%, only 13% wow. earn a degree within six years. That's huge. All those students who have the desire when they start, the same desire I have starting a college career, uh, they, but they, they don't succeed. And so why? Well, the research shows uh, four main pieces. One is transfer students typically have excess hours. Within the state of Texas, uh, transfer students average 18 semester credit hours extra. You, you were talking about that 120, that magic 120. These are excess hours will not count for a degree requirement. So they are on top of the 120. Uh, some students have many more than that. Different places I've worked, we would sometimes take in a community college student. And while a community college student ought to be coming to us with about 60 hours and associate's degree, they may come in with 90 hours. And then when they get there, they learn that they have 30 or 45 excess hours. Uh, and so they're still taking some lower division while trying to complete the upper division. So excess hours, huge. Uh, second one, that leads to excess time to completion. In the state of Texas, on average, uh, 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 statewide, uh, transfer students who do get that graduate degree, I mean that bachelor's degree, they take 2.2 years longer to graduate. Oh. There's that excess hours coming in, 2.2 years longer. That's excess debt. If students uh, run out of uh, their, their Hazelwood uh, exemption or run out of their financial aid eligibility, uh, any of those barriers can become a barrier that keeps a student from persisting. Students will come, they think, hey, I'll finish this up in a year and a half, only to find out they've got three more years of coursework to do. And they say, I'm out of here. I can't afford that. I can't do that. It's so, I, I just think about how demoralizing, right? That you've done all yes, of this yes. work and you've paid for this and you're on this journey. And then someone's like, sorry, it's going to take you yes. now three, three more years. How, how, what kind of eco strength it would take to say, I can continue. I think every person yes. would be like, I, then I'm done. Obviously I'm not going to be successful here. Right. This survey I'm referring to 
is the community college, it's the Council of Community College Student Experience, CCCSE is the abbreviation, if anybody wants to look it up. Uh, and in that same survey, they asked the student, these community college students, how did they um, get their information about transferring to a four-year institution? 80% uh, said no one on campus, not an advisor, not a teacher, not an anybody on campus, staff member, had given them any information about how to transfer to a four-year institution. Wow. And in fact, um, that, uh, that most of the people refer to that as DIY or DIY, do it yourself. Uh, that they're they're on their own trying to figure out, okay, I'm here. How do I get someplace else? They don't know the process. They don't know who to talk to, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, and if you're doing it all by yourself, you may not know that you're taking the wrong group of classes that will count to degree requirements where you're headed. By the way, I see this also with dual credit high school kids, the, the schools uh, say, hey, come take this history, come take this math, come take this English, come take this science. And then when they get to college, all of those classes will count, but not necessarily meet degree requirements. So whether you're dual credit or community college, you may think your math complete, but you get to the university and you've got to take a different math for this program or a different science for this program. So then you're duplicating courses that way. So, and so, so those that, are the big issues. Well, I just was going to say so much of that is just because colleges and universities are so insular, right? They are allowed to say, this is what yes. we take and this is how we are going to give you a degree from this school. And there's not this communication or this structure of how we respect what the other one is doing, right? Yes, yes, absolutely. And so some of the kids in dual credit who have parents who have been to college or they have older siblings who've been to college, they can be a little more savvy about, hey, you've already taken you know, two science, you don't need another dual credit science, you need this, you know, something else. But you know, first time in college, they, they don't know that they, they say, hey, this counts for college credit. And there you go. Yeah. OK, so when this idea of Relis Academic Alliance started, as you guys were incubating that, the the goal is to give transfer students this clear picture and in some ways an yes. assurance that you can go on and be successful. So can you help orient us to the structure of RELIS and how you guys have worked uh, to, to create that? Yeah. Right, the campus we're located on uh, is called uh, the RELIS Academic Alliance. It's part of a much larger uh, research facility called the RELIS campus. But uh, in the education part of it, we are in close partnership with Blinn College District, the local community college there. They have two buildings right across the parking lot from our, our two buildings. So we are co-located on this campus. Students start at Blinn, they finish with us. What we wanted to do with this partnership with Blinn is to remove these obstacles. And so we have done that with dual admission and co-enrollment programs. So dual admission, normally transfer students apply to a university the semester they're ready to take up or division classes. And in fact, if they're not continuously enrolled with the university, they're kicked out of the system and then have to reapply. And I mean, that's just standard. What we have done is tell the student, we never want to tell a student they have to wait to apply for a university program. So instead, the students can apply as entering freshmen or as sophomores anytime. And if they meet university admissions, 
Now, uh, Blinn is open admissions and universities have admission requirements. So as soon as the students meet university requirements, we can go ahead and admit them and then we save their spot through a lot of um, back office memos of uh, understanding and agreements and things. Essentially, once they're admitted, Blinn sends a every semester the student's transcript to the university so that they know the student is making good progress and is in good standing and that kind of thing. So we're able to keep them active in the system that way. And so what that does is from the day the student, uh, even before they walk on Blinn's campus, but I, it often happens during new student orientation for the Blinn students, we're there and say, hey, you want to apply for call for your bachelor's program? You, we can sign you up right now. I love them. So love that them. gives them that destination that they're not having to do it on their own. Yeah. I, they, they know so where they're going. Many, yeah, there's so many great pieces there. I love the I love the vision. We are always talking about how you give students a vision of success and that we're not stopping at two years. Your vision is you're going to continue. I was looking at a presentation that um, you did a, a couple of years ago, and it was just pulling apart even the advising, much like you've just said, in terms of you have in a, in a traditional model, you have your advisor for two years. And then after that's over, then you apply to this other school and you get another advisor. And there's no overlap, which then... I think puts punctuation on two years, right? It just puts a period there and then relies on the student to say, okay, but I don't want that to be the end. Now I'm going to do these other things. What you guys have done is really create a four year experience mm -hmm. for students where you don't have punctuation after two years. You just are moving on to the next step, which I really love. Um, can you talk about how you all are doing advising for your students? That's right. We the way we offer advising, our our advisors have, have access to Blend's student information system. They also have access. Uh, you know, one thing I haven't mentioned is that we're a transfer site, so we have eight universities offering. 25 degree programs at Rellis. And so if the degree program is a Tarleton degree program, then our advisors have, re have access to Tarleton's advising system. So they work as advisors on behalf of Blinn, on behalf of Tarleton, on behalf of a and uh, Corpus Christi or any of the other uh, universities in our program. And so they know when the student, it, what the student is taking and keeping them on track. We do individual advising. We do group advising with students. Uh, we begin the advising uh, from the time uh, they go through orientation. So two years before they're ready for upper division classes, they already have their degree path mapped out for them. And they're being given regular updates on, on how they're doing it, how they're progressing. I love that. So you, the way that you all are doing your degree choosing is that students are picking what they want to do. And then you all have kind of tied those into four different pieces, right? We have public service majors, engineering and computing service majors, business, and then natural and human sciences. And one of your schools in the network is offering degrees in those areas. And so if a student says, I want to do psychology, you say, OK, here's the school that's offering that. And then this is the pathway for you to be able to continue on there. Did, did I explain that right? Correct. And and yes, and these aren't they think of these four groups as mega majors, related groups of majors. And what we find when students decide to change majors, which happens, I was one of those that changed my major, lots of kids do. It, and now I made a pretty big jump from accounting to English, but many times they'll make a jump from accounting to general business or accounting 
to management or to marketing. So it's within that same area. Same thing with sciences. They might switch from one science to another science. And so that's why we find that putting the students' majors in these categories, these mega major groups, then the advisors can say, oh, you want to do um, uh, you know, this area or that area. And there, there are the connections, yes. I love that so much. We always talk with schools about anchor points, about where mm -hmm. students get anchored. And so it's advising, you know, it's res life. If they're on an athletic yes. team, that's an anchor. And so what you guys have done by, by putting those together is saying you don't have to unanchor from your advisor if you change your major within this mega major. You're yes. still connected to that person. They've still been yes. on this journey and you can just keep going with them. So I love that. I think that's very smart. Yes. And Rachel, could I also add our co-enrollment piece? So this is another thing we do to give the students as close to a four-year school experience as possible. For most uh, students who start and finish at a four-year institution, the native students there, uh, they don't always wait till their junior year to start taking upper division classes somewhere along their sophomore year, they've met the prerequisites, they go ahead and start taking one, maybe two of their majors classes while still finishing their lower division general education requirements. We do that with our co-enrollment. So when a, a blend student has met the prerequisites and they're ready for the upper division course, they can go ahead and take a class from their university while still taking maybe two classes from the university, three from Blinn. And so out of our student body, about half of them each semester are taking at least one class of, uh, in more than one institution. Uh, usually no more than a year of that. And then they're doing only upper division courses. But if, if you don't have that, you will sometimes have a situation where a student is in their last semester of their associate's degree. They need one, they need two classes, but they just have to sit and wait the semester out to finish that before they can transfer. We don't have, we don't make them wait. Yeah, in some ways it is the pause that gets you, right? For students in some, in some cases it is the, moment to say like we've lost inertia now we're just going to sit here and that is the place really where I know students can stop out um yes so you're you're alluding to your faculty I know your faculty are coming from all of these other institutions they're coming they're teaching yes. on your campus sometimes can you talk a little bit about the we, we just know the faculty relationship is so important and so as you are um coordinating and coaching these universities on what kinds of faculty they might send to teach your students? What guidance are you giving them? Right. Uh, so we're looking for someone who, who is very interdisciplinary in their thinking, uh, not siloed. And, and we know that very often faculty come out of graduate school very siloed in their thinking and their experience and their doctoral program. And then they go into a university where they're often interacting only with other people within their department. Again, very siloed. We want somebody who can think across the disciplines in a very interdisciplinary uh, way. Uh, we're also looking for faculty that are very hands-on with experiential learning, who want to step up and support students with undergraduate research. We do not offer graduate programs yet, that may be coming someday, but for now it's bachelor's degrees only. So we're really looking for someone who wants to focus on the undergraduate student experience. And because of our size and because the faculty, I, I, the, the majority of our faculty live in our area and our program is a face-to-face -face program with occasional online classes to connect them with someone at the at the home institution for that program. And so these are faculty who will also step in and be the faculty advisors.
for the student organizations or step in and, and help at a transfer fair. We've got one coming up on Friday. And so faculty are going to be working the tables to meet their future students. And that, that just, um, that just requires a, a little different kind of faculty member, a faculty member that has a, a heart for undergraduate education and uh, for supporting those students. So I think that that is related to something you and I were talking about earlier, which is kind of the difference between research institutions, yeah. right, and regional right. universities. And so we just have like five minutes left. Can you explain for our listeners the difference and the reason that those regional universities are so important. Yes, uh, so we, uh, I did my graduate work at Texas A&M University, at our, a research one uh, institution, very strong on research, very big uh, campus, but I did my undergraduate at A&M uh, commerce back when it was about 4,000 students. And I went there because I had a high school counselor who said, I can get you a scholarship and I can help you get in. And I went there not knowing how to do most of these things, but I had people there take care of me. That's the regional uh, comprehensive university experience. They exist all around the country, but they they have a national presence sometimes, but the majority of their students come from within 60 or 75 miles of the campus and they exist to support the industry, the businesses and the educational needs of their region. And so these are students that are often place bound. They're going to, re they're going to become the business owners. They're going to become the, the, the superintendent of the local school district, they're going to give back to the community that they grew up in, the community that educated them. Very powerful mission that is sometimes overlooked because we know how important the R1s are to the whole nation. These regionals are very important as well. I love it so much because it frames, I mean, everything that you all are doing is framed around this idea of community, right? That we start together and we finish together and we wanna get you connected and we want you to, to be present where you are. And you don't have to go off to a huge university and you don't have to wonder about what you're doing. Um, I was just looking at your website and just all of the language is about this, I mean, student life language, right? And, and club language and ring ceremony language and all of that is just this clear vision for how students can be successful from the very beginning, which I think is so remarkable um, about this program. It's not leaving our students to, to make their way. You guys have worked so hard to just deliver this package of a four-year experience for them, which I think is really beautiful. And I, we don't have time to go into all of the negotiation that you all must have had to do <laughs> with all of these different universities. But um, when I look at how hard it is to come to consensus about anything in higher education, I just imagine that those negotiations were very, very challenging. Is that a fair reflection? I mean, not for anyone's fault, but just because everybody has yeah. a different way of operating. Sure. Yeah. So your uh, we came up with a federation. Go ahead. No, no, no. Go ahead. Uh, well, I was just going to say we came up with a federation model. So instead of having to do individual agreements with all eight, we did one agreement that people signed on to. And that helped, but it was still very challenging. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I know you're having great successes. You haven't been around too long. I think you told me you started with 100 students and are up to 800 students. Is that right? So yes. lots and I'd also like to share just one data point yeah. uh, about our graduation. We are moving the needle. Our most recent cohort of students who graduated, 60% of them finished their bachelor's degree in two years after starting with us. 
So wow. it's not that extra two years to even finish in six years. They're finishing within two years because of these pathways that we're building out. That is so exciting. I I think that this model is going to impact uh, higher education in a big way. I love when we do these sort of pilots of like, here's an idea, let's try it out and see mm -hmm. if it works. And then when you have outcome success that you can tell everyone, hey, this is an opportunity in the future of higher education for us to think about how we can deliver this clear pathway for our students to be successful. So I'm very excited about it. I love all of the success. And, you know, I'm always- Yes, it, about it's very that. exciting. Yeah. I'm always thinking about the student experience and you guys have done such a good job of putting the student at the center and saying, what is it that they need to be successful and let's figure out how to deliver that. So thank you so much for joining me today. It's been such a good conversation. I know our listeners have learned and I know that you're going to get a lot of hits on your website because everyone's going to go and be like, I want to know more about, <laughs> about what you guys are doing. And um, so thank you so much for sharing with us. Uh, thank you listeners for joining us and have a good day.